being able to not being able to attend uh, the rest of the conference, um, but just watching your report backs from that last session, it's clear you've had really rich and strong conversations. Um, but in not knowing most of you and not having participated in the conference, we were a little uncertain who you were and what we should do. So what we decided to do was skate very quickly over a lot of ground. Some of it you'll know, some of it you might not know and then spend time in Q&A expanding the stuff you wanna hear more about. So I'm just gonna jump right in. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit. We're gonna start off with our first encounter organizing against the carceral feminists. We had encountered carceral feminists in the early knots. We, we encountered a woman who got a huge grant from the Department of Corrections to study whether the California Department of Corrections should build new prisons for transgender people in prison. And we sort of, we argued with her for a few hours and then left. But um, that was during a campaign in which we uh, were fighting the state of California who was trying to build its 23rd 5,000 bed prison for men over the last 15 years. So they built 22 in 15 years. They were trying to build the 23rd. And these prisons, which normally took about 18 months from introduction of the legislation, to opening the prison doors. We lost that fight, but it dragged out for six and a half years. And the week before that prison opened, the director of the Department of Corrections announced publicly this would be the last prison the state of California would build. So we thought, well, shit, we lost that fight, but maybe we won the war. We thought, all right, the last prison they're gonna build. What else are we gonna do now? Not too long after that, it turns out our victory or semi-victory in that fight put people in the Department of Corrections looking for new ways to build prisons. And the people who came forward, who that empowered were the carceral feminists in the Department of Corrections and their allies in the policy world and academic world outside. So our victory opened the door for the carceral feminists to propose a uh, gender responsive corrections commission. And when this co commission was first put together, it was a big surprise to us, one, that it happened, but two, it started out having representation uh, that included abolitionists, that included uh, formerly incarcerated people who are also abolitionists and so forth. So we thought, this is strange. It's a bad sign, but we're at the table, so we can make some trouble. And the original um, uh, mandate that the commission put out to the um, prisons for women in California was identify 3,000 people, they probably said women, 3,000 people in your facilities who should not be in prison. We thought this is a reformist reform, but not a bad one. That turned almost immediately in the hands of the carceral feminists into a project to design and build uh, female responsive community corrections centers or FRICs. And this became then the new ground of struggle for our organizations and people we were working with. And we can see in this little bit of the story how the elite capture of the anti-prison movement by people like carceral feminists turned the fight against prison expansion into an opportunity for prison expansion. So um, we got word that they wanted to, there was a proposal out looking for bids to build the first of these. Um, and we, uh, um, we decided that there were three uh, free world groups that we wanted to reach out to and try to get on our side. Um, we wanted to uh, go after the liberal media who we figured would support the idea uh, and with whom we had built pretty strong connections during the fight against this men's prison. We wanted to go, uh, uh, make sure that we could neutralize liberal feminist groups. And in the US that 
the biggest one is the National Organization of Women. Um, and I don't know, those of you who have been uh, following the fight to build a new gender responsive uh, jail for uh, women in Harlem will note that they managed to get an op-ed by Gloria Steinem in support of that proposal. So that's exactly the sort of thing we wanted to, we wanted to, if not get now on our side, we wanted to put enough doubt among the now leadership that they wouldn't take a position. Um, and the third group was the Women's Caucus of the Legislature. Uh, the legislature was and is dominated by men, um, but it's also dominated by relatively liberal Democrats who don't want to be seen as misogynist. They don't want to be seen as patriarchal. Um, and so they toss, in their condescending minds, they allow the women legislators to have considerable say over women's issues. And this was clearly being framed as a women's issue. So we saw those three groups as the key to stopping this proposal. And I should say, we, we probably had three or four months to do this organizing. The organizing also extended um, far beyond those three um, target uh, groups. And importantly, we did a lot of organizing inside. And how did we do that? We did that because already existing um, organizations such as Justice Now, we're doing work with people uh, in prisons for women on a variety of fronts, a lot related to questions uh, surrounding health care, physical and mental health care, uh, questions related to uh, people who had become incarcerated because they, were, they survived and were punished and others. So the organizing inside eventually produced a remarkable document that people passed around prisons, I still don't know how, in which 3,000, approximately 3,000 people at great peril to themselves signed a, a petition saying not in our name, do not build these new things in order to relieve the suffering that we endure because the suffering that we endure is because we're in prison, not because we're not in a prison that has lace curtains. We also engaged a lot in language wars, um, making clear that calling something a female responsive community correction center is just a smokescreen for saying prison. So we had a campaign with uh, um, posters and so forth uh, that just had a picture of a woman sitting on a bed in a cell weeping and the um, picture a drawing and uh, the legend, it's a prison. And eventually we won. We've won this struggle over and over and over again. It pops up, we win again. It pops up, we win again. And those um, victories have been extended because of what we've learned in how we do what we do um, into other uh, territories of struggle over new carceral forms because the United States has got thousands of separate carceral jurisdictions that we're fighting all at once. Uh, the first result of that victory was that the three organizations that led the fight, Critical Resistance, Justice Now, and Californians United for a Responsible Budget lost uh, funding from uh, foundations. Uh, foundations pulled money partway through a grant year, we had to lay staff off. Uh, I mean, it was a massive reorganization. That was the short-term result. The long-term result is that in 2007, when this fight started, there were um, something over 12,000 people in California's women's prisons, and today there are around 3,000. So in preventing this expansion, we did downsize the number of people in women's prisons. I'll also note, just to expand on something Ruthie said, this was the first campaign I was part of in which there was a very self-conscious and universal within the campaign, universally accepted attempt to use terms like people in women's prisons rather than women in prison or women in women's prisons. Um, it was the first time in which, for me, we used a language that we insisted uh, 
describe all the people in women's prisons and did not describe all the women in California, self-proclaimed women in, in California's prisons. That obviously, campaigning against carceral feminism is not the only sort of uh, abolition feminism there is. And Ruthie's gonna talk more about the sort of positive, what we can build with abolition feminism. But I wanna think about the sorts of lessons we learned there and maybe start with just a little list of where else we can see this sort of carceral feminism today. Um, uh, I mean, before that campaign, we saw in Bill Clinton's uh, successful effort to eviscerate welfare in the United States, so-called welfare reform, which for both liberals and conservatives was done to free poor women and women of color from dependency on welfare. So we're helping women by taking money away from them and forcing them into the job market. Um, new laws around domestic violence in the past and in the future, again, are, set, are, are framed as ways to protect women gender responsive prisons, jails, family friendly detention centers in which we don't separate children from their parents. Uh, describing all sex work as trafficking and therefore um, protecting the people who do sex work from the work they're doing uh, by making it criminal. And a whole series of changes in laws and regulation around child protective services and determinations about um, which families can be broken up, which children can be taken away from their parents, et cetera, et cetera. Almost all of these things, what they have in common is uh, an attempt to, they're framed as ways to protect women and children, and they use criminalization to do it. Fighting those things is not necessarily completely different from fighting any other carceral bullshit proposal that comes down the line. Um, but the wrinkle that the carceral feminists have is this notion that it's being done for the good of the people being locked up or the people whose families are being destroyed. Um, carceral feminism is a term that is, you know, not quite 15 years old. But those of you who've read Marie Gottschalk's Prison and the Gallows know that in the late 19th and early 20th century, what we would now call carceral feminists campaigned for women to have separate facilities, which meant more women were locked up and they were locked up longer because they were being locked up in order to teach them how to be better women. But these were very definitely, I mean, you, you recognize the language, it's therapeutic language, which is good for the people being locked up and the people being locked up were women. Um, so the key, what all those things have in common, the other thing they have in common is that liberal feminists front for these projects, whether they are a part of writing them, designing them, whether they're gonna get jobs in them or not, you'll see the glorious times of the world standing up and saying, we need to do this for women. We need to do this for children. We need to do this for families. And the challenge for us is that usually in these projects, you have three months or six months or a year to stop the project from happening. The bill is in front of parliament in two months, what are you gonna do in the next two months? I'm proposing to you that you're not, going to, you're not going to convert every liberal feminist who might front for this bullshit to, an, to be an abolitionist. That, you know, that's a great, that's a great long-term goal, but it's not gonna work in the short run. So what do you have to do? You have to figure out how to get liberal feminists to oppose these ideas based on liberal feminist principles. Whether you hate them or not, you know, I mean, there's some there's some places that you as individuals are unwilling to go, but if you're unwilling to engage on the liberal feminist terrain, you're allowing them to be spokespeople. You're allowing them to use all the weight that they've accumulated since, you know, second wave feminism started. So the last 50 years of feminist growth, you're allowing that kind of cultural mass to be used to build new prisons, to change laws, to criminalize more behavior, et cetera, et cetera. So the challenge I think for us is to figure out how to convince liberals in the short run to oppose these things, or at least not to support them. And in the course of doing that, 
some of them will become abolitionists, but it can't be we make them abolitionists and then we'll win. We have to win and then we'll make them abolitionists. Ruth, you got a note from someone who denounced us. One of the people who was responsible for pulling our funding 20 some years ago, wrote Ruthie recently and said, you were right, I was wrong. That reform was never gonna work. You know, took her 20 years. But... Well, that said, I didn't spend those 20 years trying to convince Barbara Owen that I was right and she was wrong. Um, but, uh, all of us going after the, the principles and the slippery language that enables the system constantly to reform itself in order for it to still be what it was when the fight began um, is uh, key to our conversation here. So I'm gonna close this out with a little uh, discussion about the other feminists that we are, um, we're interested in hailing here and um, raise the title of this workshop, Abolition Feminis Fem Feminism. And I think you have an S at the end, Feminisms, uh, which is fine. Um, of course, there's a new book out, Abolition Feminism Now, that uh, Angela Davis, Gina Dent, Beth Ritchie, and Erica Miners uh, co-wrote, which I hope everybody reads. Uh, there's also the revolutionary feminisms book that Brenna Bandar and Rafif Siada uh, co-edited a few years ago. It's got a chunk in it about abolition feminism, but I think the whole book is about what we're talking about. And this is the point, um, to understand abolition as uh, a, a, a large and growing aspect of and, and moment in revolutionary activity in general. So I'm going to turn and talk for the last few minutes of our preliminary remarks um, to talk about uh, working with people who did not get out of bed the morning that I first encountered them or that we first encountered one another thinking, what am I going to do with my feminist principles today? Many people did not come to the work as feminists. They did not necessarily come to the work um, organized. And these are um, people who are broadly understood to be mothers. So mothers are not I, um, uh, unique in any way, but they are distinctive in that many mothers um, come to the work of what becomes abolition out of commitments that might or might not have a larger social justice, anti-capitalist, anti-patriarchy um, uh, uh, shape to them. They are um, people who come according to uh, what one of your groups talked about, you know, kinship relations, bring people uh, into doing certain kinds of work. And also my experience of organizing with mothers is that I find mothers are often extremely tired and use their tiredness as a kind of uh, new energy almost, um, that they work and live the triple day. They have jobs, they take care of their households and they work for justice. So having been hailed to the movement because of a kinship relation and sometimes not even their own kin, but somebody they're the co-mother of, but not you know biological kin rather than fictive kin. Um, that many of, of the people that I've worked with uh, do not arrive at the work organized, but everybody's got an, an organizational imagination that arises from other experiences. So while the mothers of Mothers Reclaiming Our Children were not themselves organized already, they came from organizations such as faith organizations, unions, mutual aid organizations, people who put together, you know, funeral funds, all different kinds of organizational activities and bringing that consciousness to bear on the work that um, we did together in Southern California, uh, lifted up for people to debate and work through different organizational strategies to promote and pursue our goals and the goals were to free loved ones 
from the carceral system. Um, and we can see if we compare a little bit what Mothers Reclaiming Our Children uh, did in Southern California to the Mothers of the Plaza in Argentina during that long terror, or mothers uh, of, in South Africa after Soweto, we see similar kinds of, of um, uh, organizational and persistent uh, aspects that can help us think about how to build the movement that we need, what makes people persist once they've gotten there, especially what makes people persist once the one thing that brought them into movement uh, is either resolved or lost. So we could talk about that a little bit. And I suppose since our 20 minutes are up, I'd like to conclude by saying in a sense, you know, each of these different kinds of organizational experiences that we've shared and groups give us, give us um, some insight into how abolition feminism is a way of thinking about creating cadres who then can carry work um, into new um, situations, environments, struggles, and so forth. So thank you. Great, thank you so much, Craig and Ruthie. As always, you give us so many pearls of wisdom around strategy and organizing, and I love all the layers to um, what you're kind of talking about for us in terms of thinking through the different elements of strategy and thinking through looking to different places to build movements um, collectively. And so I thank you so much um, for that. Um, I'm gonna open it up to questions and comments. I see we've got a couple questions and comments in the chat already, um, but if people want to raise their hands um, we'll take a couple questions and comments together, and then Craig and Ruthie will respond. Um, so I see, Gracie, you've got your hand up, so you can go ahead. Thank you, uh, Craig and Ruthie, thank you so much. Um, I'm not putting my camera on because I'm in my pajamas. Um, Craig, I find really interesting and challenging what you said about kind of having to fight on the liberal terrain uh, when you're doing those short-term actions. And to kind of give you a, a bit of my context, I'm somebody who's done, you know, organizing outside of institutional structures. I also, my most recent job was five years at the equivalent of the UK's equivalent of the ACLU, including a year directing it. And ultimately that institutional context was too much for me. And, you know, that's why I'm not there anymore. But, um, I'm interested, I, I'm interested in if you could say something more about what happens after you've done that initial fight and kind of the work to bring people over to the abolitionist side. Because I think one of the things that I see a lot in the UK context is that especially NGOs and organizations will recognize like, yeah, we need to fight on their terrain. Often that's the NGOs terrain anyway. Um, and so child prisons, for example, you know, Liberty fought the fight against secure, secure schools slash child prisons, basically on the grounds that they were going to cost too much. Um, and they were successful, but the work didn't happen afterwards to kind of do the sort of deeper movement work to figure out together why are child prisons bad in principle? Um, how might we do the deeper work so that this doesn't come up again? Um, and of course, kind of 10 years later, what has happened is that the government has reneged on its initial commitment to say no secure schools. And that institute, that NGO isn't doing that work anymore. Um, but the work to kind of chip away at the fundamental idea of imprisoning children didn't happen. Um, and those liberals that initially said it's too expensive, they obviously weren't there for the fight the next time round. Um, so yeah, I'd just love to hear you talk a bit more about the movement work that happens outside of that initial fight. Great, thanks, Gracie. Um, Lola, did you have your hand up before? Did you did you want to come in? It was Hello. Up Oh yeah, <laughs> thank you, um, Ruthie and Craig, for that. That was wonderful. I did have a question, but it was essentially Gracie's question. But 
I will say another question, um, which is that I was really interested in, um, Brucey, what you were saying about how mothers use their tiredness as a, a new kind of energy and how everyone has an organizational imagination that arises from other experiences. And I guess my question is around how do you think that people in organizing spaces can harness that experience? Because often I think what stops people from um, organizing in their communities is this idea that they don't have enough knowledge or they don't have um, anything to kind of add. Um, and so I was wondering, yeah, uh, around that question of how you harness the skills that we know people have in terms of being able to keep each other alive in an organizing context um, specifically. Thank you. Um, v, I'll come to you in a sec. There was also two, some, a couple of questions in the chat. Craig and Ruthie, can you see the chat or do you want me to read those out? If you would read them, that would be great. We're blind. Okay, I'll read those out and then V, I'll come back to you in the next round. Um, so one was a question about conflict within organizing. So how do you deal with people who are part of the abolitionist movement, but who you fundamentally disagree with on a deep level or totally disavow their politics and approaches to organizing? Um, how do you navigate around people who seem to want to wreck things and repeatedly alienate other organizers um, who they come in contact with? And then also relatedly, um, uh, I'd be interested to hear any thoughts you have around disability of uh, disability justice perspective on abolition or organizing and the frequent push for activists to give our all everything to movement work even while we're living in a COVID landscape where the deadly awful consequences of overwork and exploitation feel so present. Um, and then there's another comment I'll come back to later and I'll come back to B. So I'll let Craig and Ruthie respond to that set of questions and other people can think about any other questions and comments they wanna add and I'll take those in the next round. Um, let me take, those were great questions, thank you. Um, let me take a, a, a shot at Gracie's kind of multi-part question. Um, those people are going to fade. A lot of those people are going to fade away. You, you, you know, you, you've got a short-term campaign, you bring people in, and there's very few times you say, your reason for joining this campaign is so fucked up, we don't want you part of it. We're disavowing you from the get-go. I mean, that's happened. But mostly, if people think they want to save money and they're going to campaign against a prison like you let them do it and then you work on them afterwards but those people as you say often don't come back i mean one of the things we did was we had some understanding of how the california system worked um part of that understanding was that some of the big players were contingent players they didn't actually care whether the state built prisons or not they wanted the state to build something so construction unions banks that lent the state money. We thought if we could break the cycle of building, they would shift their, their uh, political power to building hospitals or building schools or building dams, and they did. And so suddenly there wasn't as much impetus to build prisons anymore. That was part of it. Part of it was also working, as I said before, working with the liberal media and convincing them that every project that came forward had to be justified from now on. In the past, it had been the Department of Corrections says there's gonna be more prisoners, we need more space. And now suddenly the San Francisco Examiner, the Los Angeles Times, all of the big newspapers in the state were saying, show me the numbers. Why do we have to build more prisons? Why can't we divert people from prison? And this is during, you know, this is happening at the same time that there's a big hysteria around the drug war. And suddenly we're going to like, if we let out all the people who were in for marijuana possession, da 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 da. da. So there was, a, there was this understanding, I think, that um, uh, prisons were bad, they had to be justified. Um, and that allowed us to go back to, if not a, the same liberal people and the same liberal organizations, once just like them and bring them on board for the next campaign. Um, but the main thing was to keep it from happening again. Um, uh, by making it impossible for the state to build prisons. Mm -hmm. um, and let me just add one thing onto your question, which I'm not sure you ask or not. Um, but in the last few years, a lot of the liberal 
foundations and think tanks, which have been opposing this for 20 years, have now come out as quasi-abolitionists. So Benny Schiraldi, the person who's behind this women's jail in Harlem, has said, of course, we want a future in which there's no one in cages. But until that's, we're ready to do that, we need to build a new prison. Right? So, I mean, they're using our language and claiming to be in alliance with us, and we're the kind of silly and misguided people. Um, you go ahead. Okay. Um, one, one of the things that uh, uh, might be obvious, but I'm going to underline anyway from what Craig was just saying, uh, is this. When we have these debates on the liberal terrain, whether it's in the newspapers or you know at a at a meeting with carceral feminists and so forth, the audience isn't just the newspaper editor or the carceral feminists on the plenary panel at the head of the room. It's everybody who's in the room who hears the debate, who starts to see perhaps the cracks in the otherwise smooth logic that they have put forward. And those who can see the cracks in the smooth logic can, if encouraged in a variety of ways, see that other things can be done. And these other things are not only things that are related to that category called crime, right? They have in very often nothing to do with crime, such as, as Craig was saying, the builder, the construction unions and the um, uh, construction firms and the investment bankers all just want to put their energy to work. They don't care if they build a prison, a dam, a school, or a hospital. So we push them in the direction of a hospital. Um, I also want to take up uh, at the moment uh, the question about harnessing. <laughs>